Welcome to the 90s! Marvel's latest cinematic installment, Captain Marvel, took superhero movies ahead by going back in time. But did you catch all the secrets and easter eggs hidden throughout Carol Danvers' debut film? Join Screen Rant as we journey through time and space to uncover the wildest moments that the MCU snuck into this film. When Carol Danvers' crash lands on Earth in 1995, she takes us back to mid-90s dreamland. And that dreamland is Blockbuster. Most 90s kids will fondly remember spending special nights browsing shells for the latest video release or finding the movie with the most obscure cover. The Captain Marvel crew decided to be authentic by filming this scene in the last actual Blockbuster store in the United States, in Bend, Oregon. They even made the sign authentic, since the Blockbuster video sign in the movie was accomplished thanks to special effects. In keeping true to Carol Danvers' comic book arc, the storyline of the movie also has Carol deal with the effects of amnesia. And in a nice little way of connecting with the X-Men, the big screen memory loss is extremely similar to a Captain Marvel comic book story arc where X-Men's Rogue uses her energy-sucking powers to sap Carol of her memories. While she eventually regains her ability to recall events, and Rogue, after this moment, becomes good, the two super-powered women continue to have a contentious relationship. In the film, we learn that Nick Fury once proposed to call a superpowered team of heroes the Protector Initiative. That is, until he decided to call them the Avengers. Now, the Protectors seems like a logical name for a supergroup, but it also might be a nod by the writers to the superhero known as the Protector, aka Novar. Novar was a Kree who also went by the alter ego of Marvel Boy and eventually joined the Avengers himself. There's more Avengers connections than branches on the legendary Asgardian tree Yggdrasil. Mummies hate cats, and now we know why. You can never trust them, especially in Captain Marvel, where Goose the Cat is revealed to be a flurkin. And no, this alien was not named by the Muppet Swedish chef. A flurkin is a powerful being with tendrils that protrude from their mouths, and gateways to miniature dimensions kept within their mouths. This hidden alien storyline wasn't just invented for the movie either. Carol Danvers' cat was also secretly an alien in disguise in the comics, too. If this is a movie set in the 90s, then of course we should expect it to reference 90s movies. One of the biggest blowouts in 90s cinema was James Cameron's action classic, True Lies. Captain Marvel pays tribute to the film when it's advertised on a cardboard stand in Blockbuster. Arnold's head gets blurred off, but Jamie Lee Curtis's figure remains standing on the cardboard. Plus, an additional Easter egg comes from the fact that the fighter jet from True Lies was reused as the jet that the Hulk falls on in the first Avengers movie. Comic book artist Jamie McKelvey gave Carol Danvers a mohawk during his run with the Captain Marvel books in 2012. The hairstyle added a new level of spunk and attitude to the empowering character, and when Carol wears a mohawk-topped costume in the movie, it's a nice nod to McKelvey's take on the character. It also works within the story of the movie as Carol's tribute to Top of the Kree Warriors uniform. In the movie, Lieutenant Trouble is just a nickname that Carol calls Monica. The Lieutenant Trouble moniker is actually a name that comes from the comics, but it's used for a different character. The Captain Marvel comics focusing on Carol Danvers as the titular hero have her interacting with a character named Kit Renner, a young girl who views Carol as a hero. The books feature Kit Renner following Captain Marvel around and wearing a shirt that's made to resemble Carol's costume. Carol Danvers' call sign, Avenger, inspired Nick Fury to name his future group the Avengers, as opposed to the Protector Initiative. Yeah, we prefer the Avengers, too. But might he have named the superhero group something different if the Marvel creative team decided to use Carol's call sign from the comics? In the books, Carol's call sign was Cheeseburger, because she vomited one up while flying in a jet. It's not as catchy, but once the MCU runs out of Avengers storylines, maybe the Cheeseburger Initiative is the next supergroup the MCU needs. Project Pegasus is the name of the group Nick Fury created to explore Tesseract-inspired technology. It hadn't seen any airtime references in the MCU since the first Avengers movie, but the Captain Marvel film brought it back in a big way. Marvel worked with Project Pegasus to find a way to make a safe world for the Skrulls, looking to escape prosecution by the Kree. It's an interesting twist that certainly will lead to more details being divulged by Nick Fury. Ronan the Accuser was a zealot and a humorless and driven villain. He was the perfect foil for the aimless Guardians of the Galaxy who messed around just as much as they tried to save the forces of good from the forces of evil. But Ronan isn't the only Accuser around. Yon Rog goes on to say that the Accusers intend to bomb the heck out of the good guys' whereabouts. This moment confirmed for us, the audience, that the Accusers is a term used to refer to the members of Ronan's order, as well as the warships that do the bombing. 
Finally, Captain Marvel gives us Samuel L. Jackson's big comeback to the MCU. Sure, he'd shown up in cameos in the past few films and had a post-credits appearance at the end of Infinity War, but it was to spend some quality time with Fury. And in this film, he alludes to his younger days as a super spy. In the comics, Fury first appeared as Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. Then he showed up in his own series, Nick Fury's Secret Agent, before eventually becoming the leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. Another Nick Fury backstory moment comes when Nick reveals he has no children. This could be a lie, though. Nick Fury in the comics has kids, including one who changed his own name to Nick Fury Jr. and took his father's place as a super spy. This allowed Marvel to illustrate a Nick Fury who more closely resembled Sam Jackson. The mid credit scene of Captain Marvel gave us the moment we've been waiting for. Carol finally met the Avengers, or at least what's left of them. After our heroes had managed to reach out to Carol via Nick Fury's pager, Danvers appeared. She looks exactly as she did over 20 years ago, and needs to accept the fact that her old friend Nick dusted into non-existence. But how come she appears to be the same age as before? She's so powerful that time doesn't even have an impact on her? It's cool that Maria's call sign is Photon in the movie, because her daughter, Monica Rambo goes by the same name Photon when she becomes a superhero in her own right. Monica is just a child in the film. But in the comics, Monica Rambo ended up becoming Captain Marvel before Carol Danvers took up the mantle. Monica then went on to become a hero named Spectrum as well. While it remains to be seen what they do with their character, expect great things from Monica in the MCU's future. At the end of the film, Carol Danvers realizes her full potential when she becomes Binary, a nearly all-powerful being who emits seemingly limitless amounts of energy. Captain Marvel's Binary powers have a specific origin in the comics, and come when Carol absorbs enough energy to emit massively powerful fiery bursts back out of her body. It's Carol's version of the Phoenix, and it'll be interesting to see how she uses her Binary abilities when fighting bigger and stronger villains. Dr. Wendy Lawson haunts and taunts Carol as a form of the Supreme Intelligence. This being is leader of the Kree, and in the comics, its true form is that of a gross floating head with a piercing and perceptive face. Yeah, it looks how you'd imagine the baby of Slimer from Ghostbusters and Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Perhaps we'll see this being in the future, but for now, we'll have to settle on the much more attractive looks of Annette Benning. Kelly Sue DeConnick had a big part to play in Carol Danvers' evolution from Miss Marvel to Captain Marvel. DeConnick is an influential comic book writer who helped shape the Danvers we all know and love. She also had a smaller part in this movie, when she walked past Carol Danvers following the train scene. DeConnick can easily be spotted thanks to her bright red hair and glasses. Another, more acute movie reference comes in the form of the Babe poster hanging in the blockbuster that Carol falls into. And as the Screen Rant article about Captain Marvel Easter Eggs by Andrew Dice argues, Babe is an outsider, a black sheep who wants to be accepted by the other animals and join the farm family. Carol is treated like an outsider, a woman who is both Kree and human who ultimately finds her place and her true powers. Torfa may sound like some kind of unique vegan food you never knew existed, but it's also the name of the planet that serves as one of the first few set pieces in the Captain Marvel movie. The Skrulls have been hiding out on Torfa as they seek a safe place from the pursuing Kree threat. While it seems to be a good enough headquarters at first, Torfa only gives them trouble as the Skrulls grow sick from the effects of their mining on the planet's vibranium. The blockbuster scene allowed the filmmakers to cram as many movie references as possible. Another apt reference comes when Carol picks a copy of The Right Stuff up off the shelf. The Right Stuff, which tells the story of astronauts Alan Shepard, Chuck Yeager, and John Glenn, seems to parallel Carol's own journey from Air Force pilot to astronaut before she lands back on Earth. Maybe she'll be able to kick back and watch the movie once Thanos goes bye-bye. Carol Danvers blew up the Asus engine, and the resulting explosion led her to attaining the superhuman abilities she has today. The Asus, which is a hyper-powered, super-fast ship, was actually created by Dr. Philip Lawson, who comes from Captain Marvel's Ultimate Universe storyline in the comics. It's nice to see that the filmmakers were able to amalgamate so many different elements from throughout the character's history. One nice little moment helped expand the universe shown surrounding Carol Danvers in this movie. It also improved a plot hole in the Guardians of the Galaxy films. Some nitpicky fans have complained of James Gunn's choice to make it so that every character throughout the galaxy seems to understand and communicate in English. When Carol tries to talk to the security guard outside the blockbuster, she wonders if he doesn't understand. She also wonders whether her universal translator is working. We can only assume that this universal translator is what the characters use in Guardians of the Galaxy. 
Carol wears multiple colors throughout her tenure as Captain Marvel in this movie. It's revealed through the course of the film that her suit can change colors as needed. So the different color schemes we see in the movie are perfect representations of past comic book Captain Marvels. The red, yellow, and black were worn by both Marvel and Carol. The white and green color combo matches what Marvel wore when she first arrived on Earth, and the black and silver combo fits Captain Marvel's shield costume. The Kree Star Force are initially played up as heroes and compatriots of Carol. In the comics, the Star Force is a group of supervillains with whom Captain Marvel must do battle. But Yon Rog's group eventually becomes evil, and while their suits match, like many other movie versions of superhero villain teams, their names hew more closely to their comic book counterparts. This at last, Minerva, Bronchar, Korath, and last but not least, Yon Rog. While they don't look as flashy as the individual costumes in the comics, they still cut imposing figures. Stan Lee graces the screen multiple times in Captain Marvel, which manages to pay beautiful tribute to the dearly departed creator of many of your favorite superheroes. Stan Lee appears riding the train, and since this film takes place in 1995, what better than to have Stan Lee reading the script for Mallrats? It was in 1995 that Stan Lee actually cameoed in Kevin Smith's Mallrats, and this Captain Marvel appearance seems to bring his film career full circle. Excelsior, Stan. So, you've obviously seen Captain Marvel. If you haven't, get out of here, watch it, and come right back. If there's any secret or easter egg you noticed that we may have missed, let us know in the comments section below. Otherwise, keep on watching Screen Rant for more eye-opening, mind-expanding videos just like this one. We'll see you soon.